Hi, this is Ginger with the Copycat Quilter. I wanted to show you a little gallery of some potato chip block quilts that I'm going to make today. Brenda at Conquering Mount Scrapmore graciously allowed me to use this quilt block. It's one that she's created and she has lots of examples of it out in her Facebook group. I'll send a link in the comments and I hope you go over and visit her channel because she gives away blocks like crazy and you will absolutely love it. So these are two that I made and you can see they have some little snowballed corners things going. I'm going to make a short on how to make those because the video of just how to make the quilt took me a long time. This was made by Jeannie who's in Brenda's Facebook group and she let me share the picture. This one has beautiful bright colors and those red rings. She also made this one that's in the more traditional colors and using that light ring the way I will today really gives it a completely different look, kind of a shadow look. Now Minnie is in Brenda's Facebook group as well and she did alternating light and dark rings to make hers give a little different picture. We'll call it a potato chip quilt. And these potato chip blocks are very popular. I've seen them a lot, especially with scrap quilters, which I am one of. So like other quilts, the first thing I would do was to try to find, try to isolate a block. I don't know why, but I usually start in the top left corner, left to right, top to bottom. If I look at this, I can see there is a square here. And that square is repeated three times across and four times down. So I don't see anything else on this quilt that does not look like this square. So I think this is a one block quilt. When I look at this a little closer, I can see there is a square in the middle. It's made up of two rectangles sewn side by side. And for now, I'm going to ignore those snowball corners because that's like the little flare that I'll show later. It's an option. Around that center square, have another round of rectangles. There are two rectangles on each side and then a rectangle at the top and the bottom of that center square. For the last round, go around the edges of this square. I see two rectangles are at the top and the bottom of the center and each side has three rectangles tall. So I'm going to grab this and put it on a blank page so you can see the block's main pieces. I'm ready to figure out what size these blocks need to be, these individual pieces need to be. If I look at the picture, I can see this rectangle and this rectangle are the same size, and that this rectangle laid on its side is as wide as those two standing tall. Let's assume that these are two by four inch rectangles. I like that because the finished two by four rectangle means it was cut at two and a half by four and a half. And two and a half is a pre-cut strip. So I really like to be able to work with the pre-cut sizes. So if this is a two by four rectangle and I have a four inch piece here, and this is the two inch size, then the top of this quilt measures 12 inches. It's two plus four plus four plus two. So this is a 12 inch square. Here you can see the same thing. This is the rectangle two and two for four. This is a four, this is a four. So this is 12 inches. I like that makes a nice 12 inch block. So on my quilt from the other picture, on this quilt, it's three across and four down. That means it's 36 inches across and 48 down, which is a nice size baby quilt to add some borders on it. But you can also then make the squares even bigger if you want. So instead of a 12 inch square, if I wanted to make this a much bigger block so I could make a, a huge quilt quickly, I could use instead of 
a two by four, use a three by six inch rectangle. And that would give me three inches there, six, six, and three inches there. That makes an 18 inch block. If I put four of those blocks across, I end up with 72 inches. And if I do five down, it's 90. So that's a really good size twin size quilt. And I would be using four rows across and five down, 20 blocks. That makes a really nice size quilt made out of only 20 blocks. Now let's say I want to make a really sweet little baby quilt. To keep the proportions right, I would use smaller rectangles. So let's say I do a one by two rectangle, and that's about as tiny as I ever want to try to sew. If I do a one by two rectangle, and that's really one and a half by two and a half cut, I would end up with one, two, two and one. So I would end up with a six inch square. That ends up with a six inch square with 18 pieces in it. You're getting into some tiny, tiny measurements there. So really my favorite is the two by four and that's from two and a half inch by four and a half inch cut rectangles. I wanted to show you how I lay these out so that whenever I'm picking up pieces, I don't get confused on whether I'm supposed to be sew sewing them short sides together or long sides side by side. And in this case, I wanted to make a layout where I had that light ring around the center square to get a special effect when I put the quilt together. I laid out the dark pieces in the middle for my center square and then laid the light rectangles around that for the first ring and then a last ring of dark rectangles. Since there are basically only three different configurations of rectangles, I used Ziploc plastic baggies and I made marks on those baggies to show if it needed three pieces sewn short ends together, two pieces sewn short ends together, or for that center square, two rectangles sewn side by side and then a light rectangle sewn on top and underneath that center square. Let me give you a little tip here on what I do to help myself stay organized. Because for me, trying to remember which pieces needed to be end to end and which pieces needed to be in three strips of threes and strips of twos was really confusing. So I went through and laid out all the pieces for all my blocks the way I showed before. And then I stuck them in baggies. I am the queen of plastic baggies. I buy these things in gross from Amazon because I use them in the freezer for food and just sewing everywhere. I took the pieces that were supposed to be sewn end to end in strips of two. So those are those two side pieces around the middle. And I put them in this baggie stacked and I drew a picture that these are the ones that are supposed to be sewn end to end on the short end in blocks of two. And then these are my center pieces. So I show that, and I know that the dark ones are in the middle and the lighter ones are going to be on the top. That's from my pattern. So I show that to sew the two dark ones side by side long ways. And then whenever I finish that, sew the lights on top and bottom of it. This one shows that these are to be sewn into strips of three and sewn together on the short ends. So these are the two far sides of the block. This will help me stay organized because I really have challenges and it makes it super fast because then I can do chain piecing. So I know these are the ones that need to go three long, so side by side, I'm sorry, end to end. And I have two sides of those, the left and the right side of the block. I've stacked them this way, so these are 16 of the squares, these are the next 16, and these are the other 16. And now I can just sit, pick off rectangles, sew them together, and chain piece for days. So I'll show you I'll show you a little bit of the chain piecing, but I think everyone watching this probably knows how to sew. I'm using quarter inch seams as always. Got my threads caught up a little. Okay. 
and then I sew the next. I'm having trouble sewing this morning. I had arranged these so that no two would be sewn side by side. But when I iron these and clip them apart and everything, they kind of get out of order. So when I lay these pieces back out again, I'll just try to make sure then that no two match side by side. Let me finish these up and I'll come back. So here I am on the last set of two. I've got all 16 blocks, the first two sewn together. I don't trim these apart yet. I just go back and find the first one. Open it up, and then here's my stack of the third pieces in the strip. And I just start lining them up. And do the same thing. A little fiddly to get started. I don't have to worry about pressing these in between. <laughs> okay, so that one didn't cut good. I don't have to worry about pressing these in between because I'm not crossing any seams yet. And usually when I'm crossing a seam, I will press before, but not even always then. You know, if you sew over that seam and you kind of flip it to one side yourself, when you go to the ironing board, it's going to flip that way. But it's not a bad idea. I keep my ironing board across the room where I have to get up and walk about 10 steps maybe to get to it. I don't do that little nest thing around my sewing machine because I figure it does not hurt to get up and walk across the room now and then when you're sewing. You've got to get some steps in, but I don't have on my Apple Watch today, so the steps don't count anyway. I don't think I'm the only one that feels like if you exercise without your Fitbit or your Apple Watch, the exercise doesn't count. Okay, let me finish up the rest of this stack. I'll go find another piece to replace that one, and I'll come back. And this is the last one of the threes that I needed to sew. I have my handy dandy rotary blade flower cutter thing. This is a really nice tool. You can put your used rotary blades in there. It's got a little screw. You can put your used rotary blade in there and sit it here and then you can use it to clip threads. It also will let you store it inside there so you can carry it to retreats without having um, your rotary blades exposed. So now I'll start at the end and just start clipping these strings apart in between each cut piece. Super fast. Much faster than scissors. And I just keep this little thing standing beside my sewing machine all the time. Since I didn't cut in between, I have two threads to cut. So I will finish this and come back. I want to give you a little hint about ironing these. Excuse my reach. I lay them on top of each other. Depending on what layout you do, the seams may not be crossing another seam anyway, so I just like to do this really quickly. I lay them on top of each other, 
as I'm ironing. That way I'm pressing over and over and over again. And really get some flat seams super quick. And I sewed that one on the wrong direction. I'll take that one back and pull out the seam. Find Jack the Ripper to help with that. So once I get a pretty good stack, secret trick. I have this clapper that is a very fancy piece of 2x4 wood, cut oh, about 8 inches, I guess. If you lay this on top of seams after you've ironed, it will really help flatten them out. You don't have to hit the seam. You just lay it on top there, let it heat up. Um, I guess the wood absorbs some of the heat. I'm not really sure how it works, but it's amazing how much it will help flatten out these seams. So I'll just do that, pull these out of the way. Here I've laid out the two sides of the block that have the three rectangles sewn short ends together. So I am do putting together the center now, which will be the two pieces sewn side by side, and then the ones on top and bottom. And according to the pattern I'm making, the middle is dark, and the next round will be light. So I'm sewing the two lights on the top. Same thing, I'll sew these first side to side, and then probably press that seam, and then sew this to the bottom and this one to the top, and I'll have my center block ready. I finished sewing together the two pieces that go in the center, and now I'll rinse and repeat and sew the top and bottom light colors to this piece. And things are moving right along. I've finished the center square with the two dark rectangles, and I've sewn the light rectangle to the top and bottom of each one. And now for the last two sections. These are the ones that sew two by two on the short ends. So I have dark ones and light ones. The dark ones are going to go at the top and at the bottom. And the light ones, if I can pull them apart, are going to go on the sides like this to make the light ring. So I'll get busy sewing end to end, end to end of these and come back. I finished sewing all the individual components. So I have my center section that has the two darks and the two lights. I've made my two light side pieces. I've made my two dark top pieces, and then I have the two sides. So now, to be able to balance out the sewing, I'll sew these two first, then these two, and then the sides. That way I'm not doing any inset seams. So these two pieces will go together first on each side of the center. I have decided to challenge myself, and I am going to put this quilt on point. I've only tried on point one other time and I got so frustrated at how many times I had to rip out seams. Um, this time I am going to be super careful that I'm getting these triangles the right way and pin everything. You won't see me use pins a lot. I will pin everything before I take it over there to my sewing machine so that I sew them on the correct way and do not have to rip things out. For this quilt, if you remember when I was sewing them together, one side has three and one side has two. If I lay these out the right way, I'm never trying to match any of those seams. So that makes it really nice, no points to match. In order to do that, this one has three. I wanna set this one to where this seam between the two is cutting that middle one in half. You can see these center pieces are going this way and these are going that way. That's what makes me not have to match any seams there. Really cuts down on the bulk because I'm not sewing seams to seams. So that one's going up. This one will go sideways. So my center pieces are going sideways and here I have the two against the three and that seam and these seams don't have to match anything. It's 
Same thing here. I have my one, two, three section against my one, two section. So now that I have the squares laid out, I need to fill in this gap just like I did there. And I'll use a side setting triangle for that. Now, if I sew the wrong side of this triangle to the square, I will end up with something like that and put a corner inside my quilt, which is not what I want to do. I ran out of design wall uh, batting to put on my design wall because I was cutting shapes out for bowl cozies and forgot this is what I used for my design wall. In order to make sure I don't get to my sewing machine and do this instead, I'm going to lay that the way it needs to be. I'm going to flip it and I'm going to pin right there. Now, when I get to my sewing machine, I know that's the right way to do that seam. I will also, at my sewing machine, make sure this one's going sideways, and when I sew this square to that square, I will make sure that one's going up. I'm going to put that other triangle on the other end of this row, and then take it to my machine, and I'll come back. And I'm back. So I sewed that row together. Let's see if I got the corners the right way. I did bring pens because this is not going to stick to my wall. It's heavy. And actually, my design wall is not a wall. If you see, it moves. I have it hanging in front of closet doors, which um, is that rumbling around in the background you hear. And my lovely man mounted a projector screen above my closet doors for me. So I can pull it down, I have Velcro, I stick that batting to the Velcro, and I have this to use. Stuff falls off it easy because it just wiggles around a lot and I can't stick straight pins into it because it's a projector screen, but this is, works great for me. There are videos on how to make these. Uh, this was a real make it work kind of design wall for me and I'm perfectly happy with it. I also have the floor in my bedroom it has quite a lot of space. I'll lay things on the floor or lay it on my bed if it's too big or if I want to see it at a different angle. I got this screen at Home Depot for maybe $35 or $40. It's the biggest one. I think it goes 78 inches wide or up and down. It's huge, um, but because it's mounted on the ceiling over the closet wall, when I roll it up, it doesn't take any space at all. So I pinned that up so it'll stay. And I can see down here, I'm getting the straight line I need. That's good. I have the two seam matching the three there, or not matching, because this is going that way, these are going this way. And then because I've managed to get these the right way, then I have a two seam here meeting the middle and a two seam there meeting the middle. No points to match except these corners. I'm sorry, <laughs> except for these corners. And on this kind of a scrappy quilt, nobody's looking at those corners. And if they are, they are not your friend <laughs> because this is, this quilt's meant to be fun. Um, I don't do any show quilts. If you do and you want to be precise with it, great, go ahead and do that. Um, it's just not my thing. So let me lay the next row the same way I did this one. I get that sewn up and I'll be back. Now, according to the picture I took when I had these laid out the way I wanted them before, um, the middle row of my quilt, the widest row of my quilt, is five squares across. And I'll show that on the design. This is going to be my top edge, and I needed three squares. So this row ends up being a corner. I'll put the other square down here when it won't fall off my board. But up here... I need to do another corner triangle instead of a setting because there's not going to be another square on this end. Let me grab a pin so I don't sew it the wrong way. This will be the corner triangle and now you can see I have a straight line and the edge of a quilt that's straight so I can bind it easy. I will fold this corner one down
and of course pin it so I don't get it out of order. I'll put the fifth block down there and put a setting corner, uh, sorry, a setting triangle on it because it is not a corner. And I'll put another triangle on the end of this row and I'll sew this row next. I'm back at my sewing machine and I wanted to show you something close up that I was talking about. So when I'm sewing these squares together on a row, I don't want to do this. I have two rectangles where I will have all of these seams to match. If I rotate that square, so where this center is going across and this one is going up, you'll see I don't have any seams to match there. I've got the three side against the two and here are my seams so they don't have to match. It makes your job a lot easier. You don't have to do it that way. It's a square, so regardless of which way I turn it, I'm still getting the ring in the middle even to all the sides. So I am down to the last row, last few blocks to sew together. I think this is the center seam of the quilt. And we will be done. And I lost it, Bob and Chicken, on literally the last 10 inches of the last setting triangle. So I'll wind the bobbin and finish this mm, quilt. Wow, that was an experience. Piecing all of those blocks probably took me about six or seven hours. Doing that layout took me at least four with all of the goofs and messes that I made. So this is the finished quilt. And despite all the crazy making, I think it was worth the effort to make it on point. Um, this one is not quilted, so it's a finished top. But maybe making quilts on point is kind of like childbirth. Um, when you first have that baby, you swear you'll never ever do that again. And then you tend to forget. So maybe nine months, a year from now, I'll decide I can tackle another one of these quilts. We'll just have to see what happens. Um, I think I am through with an on-point quilt for now. Um, the next one I was going to show was actually my first one I ever did, and it is a king or queen size, but I'm just not going to touch that right now. I have another quilt I'd like to show that was my grandmother's design that I remember her cutting out of newspaper and uh, cutting all the pieces with scissors, and she did hand piecing and hand quilting and could finish a queen size quilt in about two, two and a half weeks. So I think I'll pull that quilt out next and then maybe after that I'll go for that other quilt that is a really nice pattern and maybe I'll make a little tiny one that I can lay on point, lay right by my sewing machine and maybe possibly pick up the pieces and put them order the right way. So please like, subscribe, hit the notify bell if you want to and leave a comment below. Um, maybe you have some good hints on how to do uh, on-point quilts for me and I can learn something too. So for now, uh, it's goodbye and I'll see you next time. Okay, I had challenged myself to not have to use the seam ripper on laying this out because I was being so careful and even being that careful, of course, I just had to rip off a triangle. <laughs> I'm back again on the same row I have to rip this one again because I sewed that triangle on the one, wrong way. I think I may move this design board to the floor because it's getting too big to lay out and now I've made two mistakes on the same row. So and we're back for the same row why, that I've had to rip each end on and trying really guess what? I, I even managed to rip my triangle this time when I was ripping out the seam. So I'll cut another triangle and see if I can get this one row put together so I can finish this quote.